All right, beginning now. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Kate Bodiger from the National Neutropenia Network. We'll give it a few minutes and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for being here. All right, well, we can go ahead and get started um, so that we aren't wasting everyone's time that's here now. So um, thank you for being here today for our genetic testing um, webinar. Um, again, I'm Kate Bodiger with the National Neutropenia Network. Um, thank you for being here. Um, the National Neutropenia Network um, is a patient support organization, um, supports patients and their families and offers um, information, education through our website, conferences, webinars. And so um, thank you again for being here. So I'll go ahead and introduce the, the panelists who will be here today. So if you wanna advance to the next slide, that would be great. Um, so after um, I'm done talking, Jan from X4 Pharmaceuticals will take over and provide an overview of the Path Forward um, program. And then we'll hear from Dr. Link um, a, on a doctor's perspective. Um, then you'll hear about my experience um, with my genetic testing that I had done through Path Forward. And then Natalie Beck from Genome Medical will talk about genetic counseling. And then we'll wrap up with Michelle Ree from X4 taking questions and answers, or taking questions, and hopefully we'll be able to answer your questions. Um, so. Um, Jan from X4, go ahead and take uh, take over. Thank you, Kate, and welcome everyone to the to the webinar this afternoon. Um, Path Forward is the name of a free genetic testing program for patients with neutropenia that's sponsored by X4 Pharmaceuticals, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Next slide, please. X4's mission is to develop treatments that have a clear and profound impact on patients living with rare disease, including Wim syndrome and uncommon cancers. Next slide, please. The focus of X4's work is the development of targeted therapies for diseases that result from dysfunction in the movement of immune cells caused by a disruption in a genetic pathway called the CXCR4 pathway. The lead product candidate that X4 is developing is called Mavericksifor, which is a first-in-class oral inhibitor of the CXCR4 pathway. There are several clinical trials underway that are sponsored by X4 for patients that have Wim syndrome, which is a rare primary immune deficiency disorder associated with neutropenia, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, which is a rare cancer of the plasma blood cells, and severe congenital and chronic neutropenias. Our offices are located in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, and we have a research and development facility in Vienna, Austria. Next slide, please. So in the course of our work at X4, we recognize the value of genetic testing in obtaining an accurate diagnosis in rare disease. We also recognize that sometimes patients have difficulty accessing this testing. So in June of 2019, we launched the Path Forward program through a partnership with Invitae Laboratories to offer free testing to patients who may have a genetic mutation known to be associated with congenital or chronic neutropenia. Next slide. Oops, sorry, back, back one slide, sorry about that. Um, so early testing may be the most direct and cost efficient and accurate way to confirm a diagnosis of congenital neutropenia. In 2019, when we started the program, we started with testing only 23 genes 
uh, that were neutropenia genes. And now we have expanded that testing uh, and to include 407 genes that are known to be associated with primary immune deficiency. Next slide, please. So the eligibility for the Path Forward program is that patients must have a suspicion of having a congenital neutropenia and neutropenia that is not related to drugs or chemo or virus uh, at any point in their life with a um, absolute neutrophil count of 750 or less. So in the current program, the a healthcare provider is required to order, uh, to order this genetic testing for a patient. And now X4 has partnered with another company, uh, Genome Medical, which you'll hear from very soon, in addition to Invite, to further expand the Path Forward program. And Natalie will be providing uh, a lot more detail on that a little bit later in the webinar. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Link to talk about the doctor's perspective. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Dan Link. Uh, so I'm an adult hematologist. I've been working on neutropenia in the clinical and research setting for from 25 years. Um, and so I was asked to give the, the doctor's perspective. We, I see many patients get referred to me for neutropenia. And one of the, the big issues that comes up is um, when to do genetic testing. So I kind of just want to cover that uh, from, from a physician's perspective. Next slide. So there, are, in my view, there are four major reasons to, to get genetic testing, um, and I'll go through all of these. So let's start with the diagnosis. Next slide. Next slide again. So what I'm showing you here is the results of genetic testing under, in a research basis, in a, in a uh, research study that I was involved with, um, looking at patients in North America, there were 170 patients who presented with um, suspicion for congenital neutropenia, these are mainly younger patients. And I think what you can see from this pie graph is that about in 70% of cases, we were able to make a likely genetic uh, diagnosis. This may be a little bit lower for, for patients with a lower suspicion of congenital neutropenia, but, but I guess, but the bottom line from my perspective is we can make a diagnosis um, in a substantial number of cases. Um, so why is that important? Well, I think one of the things is, is it, I think it's, it's helpful for the doctors and I think for the patients to know what do I have. In particular, we can stop the kind of like reiterative cycles of uh, uh, repeated testing, sometimes expensive and invasive testing uh, to make a diagnosis because a, a genetic diagnosis really provides us with a clear picture of what's going on. And, and the other thing I would say is, you know, in the years past, we, we might sequence one gene at a time, like Elaine, for instance. And I, I don't think there's any role for that anymore. I think that, that uh, the genetic testing, especially with the Path Forward program providing free testing, uh, it would be to go ahead and, and test for all of these genes at the same time. Next slide. So the other reasons as a doctor that I, I wanna make a genetic diagnosis is to look for syndromic features. And next slide. So, so what I mean by that is that if, if patients carry a specific, so let's, a patient comes in with neutropenia and, you may, and they end up having a mutation of the gene called the LANE, we know that, that that doesn't have any syndromic features. It's just pure neutropenia. But if they have a mutation of say CLPB, a different gene, we know now that those patients may have cataracts that are, have not been appreciated or neurologic disorders, and we can look for those, maybe even preemptively um, do things that would, would uh, help with those, those treatments. So you can see that I just I, I highlighted three uh, case examples of a mutation in which neutropenia is part of it, but there are also other parts of the syndromes that, that would be important for doctors and for, and for patients to know about. So that's very helpful. And the genetic counselors um, who would know this very well, and they would help the, the physicians uh, to, to identify these sometimes complex and rare disorders. Next. Okay, well, you know, the most important reason to do genetic testing would be, would be treatment. And I, I will say that this is evolving, we, we, but we have clear examples already where uh, a genetic diagnosis 
um, can result in a, a different treatment uh, regimen. So next slide. And then I just wanted to give you guys one example, and that is the example that Jan mentioned in the beginning, which is WIM syndrome, okay? So normally, and this is just kind of a quick, fun um, a research thing, is normally, you know, your neutrophils are made in your bone marrow. That's where they're made. And they get released into your blood. You know, neutrophils in your bone marrow don't, you, don't do you any good, okay? They have to be in the blood and look for infection. And so the CXCR4 regulates the release of neutrophils from the bone marrow to the blood. And when you have a mutation of CXCR4, that process is screwed up. So these patients with WIM syndrome actually make neutrophils just fine, they can't get out. So if we find a patient with a CXCR4 mutation, then we actually know now that drugs that block, uh, that, that target this mutation will help these neutrophils get into the blood and do their job. Um, and so there's an, a clear example of a, of a targeted therapy uh, based on genetic findings. Next slide. Okay, now the last area I wanna talk about is something that I know my patients are asking me, but it's a little, a little bit off target. This is not about diagnosis. Uh, next slide. It's about this complication. So patients with congenital neutropenia have a risk of developing leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome. So this is a, this is a much feared complication. And so um, the, there, uh, there is a, a lot of uh, physicians now that are ordering genetic testing, not to look for germline mutations, but to look for acquired mutations, we call those somatic mutations, with the hope that if someone has uh, acquired mutations, that might be predictive of who's gonna get MDS or AML. So I just want to summarize that I just wrote a, a, an opinion piece about this for American Society of Hematology, and I think it's pretty clear that somatic testing is not useful right now, not clinically useful. So outside of a research study, we do not recommend that you get genetic testing um, looking for um, these acquired mutations because they're really just not that predictive of AML or MDS. So in any case, in summary, I, you know, to me, this is one of the, the no-brainers for my patients. And essentially for everybody, I'm recommending they get genetic testing if they haven't had it already. And with that, I will uh, pass it on to Kate. All right. Thank you, Dr. Link. Appreciate your perspective. All right. So I'm going to share my personal experience. So this is um, not as the executive director of the National Neutropenia Network. Um, but my personal experience, um, I do have idiopathic neutropenia. And so um, I did decide to go ahead and um, have the genetic testing done through Path Forward. Um, so you can go ahead and um, next slide. So I just wanted to share my experience with you. Um, it was fairly easy. Um, so I, it was easy to sign up um, I, and had a kit sent to me. So I basically went on the website. Um, I worked with my doctor. Um, for, for him and I to fill out the form, and then that was faxed in. Um, within, I want to say within a week, I received a kit in the mail that had um, information. It had the saliva kit and contact information for me to contact someone at Invitae if I had any questions. Um, and so I was able to mail it back um, fairly um, Soon after that, it was very easy. It was a saliva testing kit. So you just had to have like so much in the kit um, when you sent it back, but it was very easy and you sealed it up in the envelope. Um, I'm pretty sure it was a double envelope. But um, I did wait a while um, only because my doctor did not go in and, and said it was okay to share the results with me. And so um, I went to Envite's website and requested um, the results. And so when I did that, it took four weeks for me to get the results. So um, just a personal um, experience, please make sure that you advocate um, for yourself with your doctor and make sure that you request those results yourself um, within Vitae. It might be a little different now, um, but just make sure that you're not sitting there waiting for the results. So um, I finally did get the results. Um, it's an 11 page um, report. I do have some things to um, show you on the next slides. I will say it's a somewhat confusing. There's a lot of genes that are listed. Um, obviously there's over 400 on the panel. And so um, it's, there's a, obviously a lot of medical jargon, um, but it is very interesting. 
Um, I will admit that I um, had a feeling of um, a lot of people with neutropenia experience this as far as why do we have neutropenia? What happened? Why did I get it? Um, and, and sometimes there's no answers. Um, and so I did feel a little bit of that um, unknown and there's no reason um, for, for why there's um, variants that were found. So they did find four variants of unknown significance. Um, they're, they're basically, they're unsure of the impact on my health as far as like if anyone had these variants with, found within their genes. Um, there's really no known, um, no known reason for the impact on the health. So there's a mutation in the gene, um, but we really don't know what it does. And so um, there's no phenotype um, disease or condition. Um, and so they can't tell what the cause is. And it is a very common result. Um, so it does happen with many um, that do genetic testing. They're, they're gonna find some variants of un, uncertain significance. So that is a common result. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of my variants, um, we actually replaced lysine with glutamine. So it's a protein change. Um, and this variant, um, this variant qualified for family study testing, um, which I'll admit I did not um, go ahead and, and participate in. I didn't ask my family um, to do that. One of the reasons is um, I'm adopted. So um, I, I didn't go forward with that. I also didn't want my kids to go through um, testing only to find out things they really don't need to know at this point, <laughs> my thought. And then also, um, even though we have some variants that are found within the genetic testing, our body does, um, it, they're able to tolerate these changes. Um, and so, um, yeah. So I did contact a genetic counselor um, at through Invitae after I received the results, um, just to walk me through um, the report, um, she was very helpful in explaining some different things. Um, one, she explained, you know, there's different results. There's pathogenic um, genes, which they did not find any. Um, and then there's some that are called likely pathogenic, and there wasn't any found as well. And then there's these variances of unknown significance, which again, they found the four. And then um, there's benign, which is obviously the majority of the genes that they test. And so um, the genetic counselor is very helpful. I probably talked to her for about 10, 15 minutes, just walking me through um, the report and talked about risk for disease and conditions really is a um, multi-factor as far as environmental, personal diet and lifestyle. Um, so she basically said, you know, try not to get in the weeds. Um, of the report, which we probably most all do is, you know, find information in our reports and go on Dr. Google. <laughs> so, um, so I admit I would do, I did that for the very, the variant, um, the one variant that they um, were concerned about a little bit, but um, obviously you want to advocate for yourself and talk to your doctor about your test results. So um, you can go ahead and show the next couple slides. So this slide is the genes that were analyzed in the report. So again, there's over 400, I think there's 407 um, when I did the testing. And so they were all listed here um, as far as the genes analyzed. And again, most of those were benign. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide. I think um, that is it. So I will turn it over to Natalie. Um, thank you for listening. And, and again, we can take questions at the end. Thanks so much, Kate. I think um, everyone definitely benefited from hearing your experiences. Um, and I'm glad you're able to highlight a lot of um, different aspects of that. Um, next slide, please. Great. So um, just a little bit of background for me. So I'm the lead genetic counselor for our pediatric and rare disease services here at Genome Medical. And I'll give you all um, some additional background about uh, Genome Medical Services. I've been a genetic counselor for over 12 years. Um, before joining Genome Medical, I was working in uh, probably more traditional academic medical centers and um, seeing patients in person and um, helping them navigate this uh, journey of considering genetic testing. And so I'm able to do that now in a telehealth model, and I'm excited to be able to um, reach more patients and families because um, we're able to see people across the country. Uh, next slide. So of course, um, our team always um, 
has us give this nice disclaimer um, that this webinar doesn't um, provide any specific information for any of you for medical diagnosis or advice. It says general information shouldn't be construed otherwise. We don't recommend you rely on information in this webinar to make medical management decisions. Um, always consult with your providers. Next slide. So some additional background on Genome Medical. So we are a completely uh, digital and telehealth uh, model. We're a virtual private medical practice, and our entire focus is on genetic medicine and genetic aspects of healthcare. So we're really excited to get to work with Path Forward um, since this fits exactly um, what we do. We're trying to um, be able to reach patients and families at every stage of their genetic healthcare needs. Next slide. And so today, you know, we're focusing on neutropenia, which really fits into our pediatric and adult rare disease umbrella. But um, for additional background, if there's other family history concerns or other things that you might have going on for yourself or for a family member, we have experts um, across all areas of genetic healthcare, including cancer, um, hereditary cardiac conditions, reproductive needs, um, and some pharmacogenetics. And um, on average, all of our 60 plus clinician, clinicians have about a decade or so of experience. So you're definitely getting um, folks with a lot of experts uh, tease in these areas. Next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about genetic counselors like myself, the roles that we play in healthcare, and then um, what to expect in a genetic counseling appointment and the different types of appointments you could pursue. So generally speaking, counselors are providing information to people and their families, specifically about um, a potential hereditary condition that they might have or be at risk to have, really reviewing test options, uh, facilitating decision-making, and then being available throughout that process. Uh, both before and after um, to help make sure people feel comfortable with that information and how to use it. And the National Society of Genetic Counselors website is an excellent resource for um, kind of reviewing these types of concepts again in your own time and also um, locating providers. Next slide. So genetic counselors um, serve a lot of different roles depending on um, how you might encounter them. There's genetic counselors in our research roles um, in helping to develop some of these um, exciting new tests and treatments. Um, we're often working within teams as the genetic experts. We provide education, not just to our patients, but in venues like this where we're getting to meet other providers and um, communities. And certainly we're working directly with people one-on-one -on -one, um, and providing counseling. Next slide. So um, I think the big question I may not have specifically answered yet is um, what kind of training do genetic counselors have? So we all have advanced training in medical genetics, um, specifically human genetics, as well as psychosocial counseling techniques. We're all board certified, um, about half of the states in our country require licensure. And so um, our team is licensed across the country. And so we're able to use that training and expertise to really help individuals and families make decisions um, that are important for their genetic health. And so our thought is, you know, each person receiving the right test at the right time for the right reasons. And those reasons can differ per person and per family. And so there's not a one size fits all process. And so our job is to help people um, navigate that and figure out what works best for them. And so the counseling itself is a process. So that is an interactive discussion and helping people understand and adapt to medical, psychological, and familial implications of a diagnosis that they might receive. Next slide. Um, so when we think about genetic conditions, um, I know Dr. Link was um, highlighting Wim syndrome. That's a fantastic example of um, many genetic conditions being quite rare. And so when we're seeing patients and families either in a pediatric or an adult genetics clinic setting, um, and we're thinking about these rare conditions, that's usually less than one in 200,000 people, if we're using the definition for the United States for rare disease. Um, and so um, as Kate was mentioning, like sometimes these terms can be really overwhelming because these are not things that are easy to identify either on Google or through other um, available resources. And so counselors are really here to help translate those complex terms and test results into something that's more usable and helpful. 
We're also available to assist in decision making and empowering people to make the decisions that fit their needs the best. And I always like to highlight that counseling can be independent of testing. So we see people um, like Kate who have already had their testing and they have really good questions about results. We also sometimes see people um, before they've had any testing and they may end up concluding that testing isn't for them at that moment and that's okay too. So counseling can be helpful just as part of that process. And then um, because we see people throughout the country, we um, have extensive training in things like cultural competency and awareness, um, as well as access to interpreters and medical note translation. Um, we cannot currently see family members or friends that you may have outside of the United States due to licensure restrictions. Next slide. So we'll talk through just briefly, um, just to highlight things that you could expect, um, you know, before, during, and after a genetic counseling appointment. These certainly apply to all of our visits at Genome Medical, but I think translate well to genetic counseling appointments that you could um, have, or maybe you've had with a local provider. So obviously there's a scheduling process. If you um, have pertinent medical records that you're able to gather, it's always really helpful to have on hand to be able to answer some of those family medical questions. And then we will do a detailed family history. So kind of knowing if other people in your family may have had similar experiences um, or perhaps they have um, something else that feels unrelated to you. Um, as Dr. Wim had pointed out, sometimes other features might actually be important clues. And so we'll definitely take a detailed history. Um, and some clinics, including Genome Medical, will send out a questionnaire so that we can make sure to help tailor every appointment to what your main questions or concerns are. Next slide. So during the appointment, um, these are on average about 30 to 60 minutes long, and some genetic counselors are gonna have um, individual appointments um, without uh, additional providers. And then um, occasionally a genetic counselor might be embedded within another clinic. And so you might be seeing them in conjunction with another specialist or provider. And so during the appointment, we're gonna discuss the person and or family's goals, review those medical and family histories, discuss you know, what condition or maybe a group of conditions called a differential might be considered based on those family and medical histories, and then talk about any of those diagnoses in detail that seem uh, most appropriate or most concerning. And then based on that information, what tests might be available and if there are associated costs and what insurance coverage would look like. Um, we also review the scope of laws relating to genetic discrimination and which prohibits, um, as well as setting up a plan for results discussion. Um, next slide. So after the appointment, um, we'll always be sending a summary or what's called a visit note, discussing and reviewing everything that was reviewed. And then if testing was pursued, you know, we're going to be able to order that at Genome Medical. Um, and so that's something that um, some people find helpful. It's coming to us. We are able to provide the counseling and order the testing. Um, we are certainly also to see able to see people who have had their testing ordered by a local provider as well if they provide those results. And then um, depending on the results discussion plan that we had developed, you know, we will work with that family to either provide the report ahead of time and make a plan to touch base. Some families might provide, uh, prefer to have everything provided at once. And so we'll make that preferred plan and then always provide copies of test results with a summary letter that's customized to that person. Um, if family variant testing is recommended or applicable based on a person's results, we're certainly available to talk through that option and coordinate it um, if it's appropriate. And um, so the Path Forward program is one that we're really excited to be able to facilitate and see people through for um, genetic counseling with the option of testing. And I know some people will come to us uh, directly through that program. And so we wanted to show you a little bit on the next slide that we'll play a video so you can just see um, kind of the ease of navigating that process. Uh, next slide, yep, perfect. And I think we were gonna keep the video muted just because the background noise is lovely, but it's the music's a little loud. 
So there's a couple different ways you can navigate to our website. Um, but one thing we always like to highlight is that we have a whole team of care coordinators and they're available by phone or through this lovely online chat feature during business hours. And it's a real person. So you'll always get to somebody who's part of our company. It's not a chat bot. <laughs> and they can either answer your questions right away or direct you to options that fit your needs the best. And um, if it's something that the person opts to navigate on our site, they can click that schedule now button um, and the self-scheduling options are available 24 seven. And so by putting in a little bit of contact information, people are able to decide if they um, want to see us before testing, which is in this case, and they'll just pick their location for state licensure purposes. And then they're gonna get to see all the available providers and set themselves up for that appointment. And that's the same process for a follow-up visit and um, answering some questions, we can make sure to really customize their visit and have everything ready to go for them. People can join um, our visits through a Zoom video link like we're doing today. And that's what this example is. We also have telephone appointments available and that is a person preference. So we're able to do either and we'll get their information and help coordinate testing after a visit. And in this example, this person had set up a plan with their counselor to receive their results securely after the visit um, and then set up a follow-up genetic counseling appointment to be able to ask questions and get additional aspects clarified. And so this person is logging back in and now they're interested in self-scheduling for that follow-up visit. And I will turn it back over, I think, to Jan or Michelle, who's going to lead our question and answers. Yep, turning it over to me for the Q&A. Um, thank you so much, everyone. The, the presentation was fantastic. It explains a lot about uh, what we're trying to understand about the doctor patient experience. Thank you very, very much. Um, I have some questions and I also wanted to just note that for any questions that have come in and for any questions that you put into the Q&A and uh, if anyone does want to add questions, you just click on the Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen and type it in. Um, we can't provide any medical advice uh, and because uh, this we don't know you, no one here knows your medical story, we wouldn't be able to provide individual um, information either. So anything that's come in is going to be very generalized <laughs> um, if I've like adapted your question at all. Uh, so the first question is, um, what if someone has had a genetic test before, would it still be something to do to get another genetic test? I'm happy to start that answer and then I can see if Dr. Link has any additional thoughts. So um, my enthusiastic initial response is always yes, um, genetic testing has evolved over the years. And so um, some earlier tests may not have covered all the genes um, that we now have available. So genetic counselors can also review prior test results and help um, guide you in that as well. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Link, do you have anything to add? Yes, I, I would say Natalie nailed it exactly what I would have said too. So, you know, there's different levels of genetic testing. Sometimes the genetic test is just one gene. So I think that the you know, if you're interested, I think going through the path forward genetic counseling um, would be great. And then the genetic counselors could tell you whether it's worthwhile or not. Uh, but most of the times I would say yes. Thank you. Sorry, my, my cell phone just went off. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, the, the next question is about the family testing. Can you explain the family testing, what that is, why you would do that? Sure, so family variant testing is a pretty common term and I think it gets used in a few contexts. So um, one scenario is that a person might receive a specific diagnosis. So as Kate was mentioning earlier, something that's considered a pathogenic variant or a disease or diagnosis related variant in a gene. Um, if that was identified on one person's test, we would talk with that person or if they were 
a child, we talk to their parents and discuss, you know, who else in the family might benefit from genetic testing um, and what are the different reasons why. Some of the reasons might be to identify at-risk relatives like siblings or parents. Um, another scenario for family variant testing could be if a person who pursues testing has an uncertain or unclear result. Occasionally labs will offer family variant testing to try to learn more information and see if that variant is shared amongst other family members either who also have things like neutropenia, or maybe they um, don't have those features, but happen to share the variant. And that can all add to that data that we are needing to help clarify some of those uncertain ones. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Dr. Link, anything to add? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, uh, another question we have is, uh, if someone has done this test um, and their doctor ordered it, uh, if uh, the results were reported to their doctor, hypothetically, and the patient has requested the results as well through the website, there's, and there's over a month delay in the release of the results. <laughs> what would be the, the next steps and um, why might that be uh, the case? I think that might be something for Sergio if you're available. Yeah, I am here. Um, so if that does occur where you're saying that your results aren't releasing after the 30 said days, um, it's always best practice to call in VTA client services. Um, be prepared to just provide some basic identifying information, such as um, your name and then the RQ number um, or your date of birth if you don't have that RQ number. And we can manually uh, release those results to you via the secure portal. Um, yeah, if you ever run into any issues with the portal results release, just give us a call. We're always here to help you guys. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, and then the next question we have is, how old do you have to be to get the test? You can be any age. Um, <laughs> I know um, one of the criteria I believe Jan mentioned earlier is congenital neutropenia, so neutropenia appreciated since birth or early infancy, but you certainly don't have to be in that early age range to pursue testing. Um, every genetic center is different. Genome medical, we can see people from birth, I usually say to like 120, because I, I want to make sure we can accommodate <laughs> everybody. Um, so yeah, no, no restrictions um, on age. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I was just going to add, uh, Michelle, too, I think Natalie knows as well, and so does uh, Jan, but, the, but you know, we see patients who present in adulthood with what with, with might be a classic young, you know, infant-like presentation. So uh, I, th I, would, I would definitely say genetic testing. As you get, uh, you know, like um, Kate's idiopathic case, the, the, the likelihood of making a genetic diagnosis for idiopathic neutropenia is much less likely than it is for um, a very you know, strong case in, in infants, but it's still worth doing. Thank you. Michelle, I might just I might just add that in the original path forward, when we had the original criteria, um, there was a requirement that uh, patients have at least six months of neutropenia prior to being tested, and then we we actually had a lot of uh, a, a lot of contacts that wanted to check patients that were less than six months infants, and so they didn't have that that uh, history. So we eliminated that criteria. And as, as Natalie said, um, testing from birth is now, uh, is now appropriate. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and this is a question for Dr. Link specifically. If one of your patients came to you um, with these test results, um, how would you react and feel? Well, I mean, that, that's part of what I do on a regular basis, Michelle. So when, when someone comes in, we review all their medical record, including their genetic testing. Um, most of the time, frankly, patients come to me for referrals, they don't have genetic testing. So, then, um, so I would actually prefer that. So, uh, I mean, that, that we would welcome that sort of data. So that, for, that would be very helpful for me to try to sort through um, you know, what the di likely diagnosis is and come up with a treatment plan. Um, so, so very helpful, I encourage that, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think this is a question that I would um, put to Kate. Uh, the question is around how to find doctors who might be able to help with um, 
getting a genetic test or understanding uh, how to deal with genetic test answers? Sure. So my um, first thought is is to ask your um, your doctor that you see on a regular basis. Um, if you don't have one um, that you see, um, I definitely would um, have maybe ask for a referral from your general doctor. Or um, if you if you don't have a doctor, I assume most people would have a doctor they see. But if you don't certainly could contact the Neutropenia Network and we could put you in touch with someone that's um, in your area. So I don't know if Dr. Link or Natalie, if you have other comments, but. You know, I, I, I really uh, like the, um, this idea that you can get genetic counseling um, directly through this path forward. Um, you know, the, I will, I will say this, you know, that these are rare diseases. And so um, many of the standard pediatricians and hematologists just really aren't that familiar with neutropenia. So I think, so, but the, the genetic counselors, they, they're very smart people and um, they do. And so they, they can really help. And then I think um, finding a physician that has some experience with neutropenia of patients is, is useful um, sometimes. Sometimes you don't need that expertise. And, and I think the National Neutropenia Network, I think would be one, one source to find uh, someone in the area because there, there are a number of uh, experts um, around. I would piggyback on Dr. Links just um, to share that I think his summary is great that um, genetic counselors, whether they're part of a larger team or um, like, you know, medical, we're kind of our own practice, you know, we are experts in genetic counseling, but we are going to be partnering with either your local hematologist or geneticist or, you know, we need um, people's local providers for that long term prognosis and treatment plan. And so um, we also see patients and families who want to self refer as well. So we can definitely see people through Path Forward um, and self-referrals, of course, and then we can also use the Neutropenia Network and other resources to help direct them afterwards. Um, so hopefully that shouldn't feel like a barrier in the process. Wonderful. Thank you. I think this sort of goes to show there are a lot of resources out there, um, and part it's part of that. I think what Kate had talked about, that self-advocacy as well, um, it is a full-time job uh, being a patient and sometimes this is part of it. Um, that actually is the end of the questions that we received. So if anyone has any additional questions, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our, I think our contact information, uh, Kate's contact information is there. Oh, we just had um, one more question come in um, about uh, how will chronic uh, idiopathic patients uh, ever know if there are new reasons found uh, due to genetic testing? So, so Michelle, I think that the, that you're asking that the idea is that we're constantly learning more about causes of idiopathic neutropenia. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is, it's a, it, is a, it is an evolving field. And, and um, you know, uh, my group last year reported a new cause of neutropenia, you know, so um, I'm, I'm sure uh, Natalie already knows about it. It's on her, her, her list, but, but you need people to really keep up with it. So, but for, for individual patients, it is kind of hard. I think that you know, I know the National Neutropenia Network uh, provides, you know, um, some, some like Facebook content, or, or perhaps, you know, um, you know, the Medical Advisory Board with Kate, we could, we could try to, you know, uh, maybe post some things about new, new things that are found. Um, but otherwise, I think you just got to continue to, to work with your doctors and, and um, to, to see if anything new has come out. Yeah, there are new genetic causes found and they, are not necessarily being tested for on the panel. This is true. Yeah, I would say um, one thing we definitely offer to patients that we do see in genetics is that exact concept of kind of like, don't be a stranger and please consider coming back every um, year or a couple of years, depending on the age of a person and what their concerns are. Um, so that exact reason Dr. Ling mentioned as newly discovered genes are kind of moving from that research realm into clinical testing, you know, we can take a little bit of that burden off patients and families of like, what's the latest and greatest and, and help fill in those gaps, you know, if they've had a follow-up appointment so we can bridge them from the last test. 
And I think it also circles back to that first question about if you've had a genetic test before, should you get one again? Um, sometimes yes, because as the science evolves, more gene or more mutations might be identified, uh, and the next test can uh, sometimes have more information available. And um, we actually, if similarly for uh, this program, there's a, a website, idyourpid.com. Um, if you sign up for updates, if there are updates to the genetic test or like if there's an increase in the panel, we'll update with that information uh, if you, you sign up for that list. So I think that might be the end of the Q&A, but if you have any other questions, um, I think you, you have, oh, nope, <laughs> sorry, it looks like, oh, the question was about what the website was. It's ID, uh, your PID. I'll put it in the chat um, right now so that everyone has it. Um, or I'll put it in the chat in a second. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Jan to close though while I type that in. Well, thank you everyone for those those great questions. And uh, I think we've learned, I've learned a lot today in this um, webinar. And so when, when I first talked about uh, the Path Forward program, I mentioned that the way it has been historically is an order must be uh, submitted from a physician. Um, it, so your healthcare provider would, would need to enter that in. And so part of what we're going to be doing with Invite and Natalie, Natalie's company, Genome Medical, is launching a program where patients can self-refer. And so we're working now on the website, uh, the Path Forward website, so that it will be very easy when you go to that website to tell, uh, to, to know where to order. It will say uh, that a patient can start here. So that was, and then that will go to the landing page that Natalie was going through uh, on the short video. So there'll be more information coming about that. And, and then there will be, as part of this program, all of the counseling opportunities pre and post will be available as well as uh, sharing your results with your physician. So there'll be more information coming about that and uh, we will keep Kate updated and she can keep everyone updated about that as well. So thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kate now to close. All right, thank you, Jan. Um, just would like to thank all the attendees for being here today. Um, we appreciate it. We appreciate your questions. And also thanks to X4, um, Genome Medical and Dr. Link. Thank you all for making this webinar possible. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Um, we will provide it through our website um, once um, the information about um, getting your test is available. So we'll make it available to, to our attendees as well as others who were not able to make it today. So thank you again, everyone for attending. Um, appreciate it and hope you all enjoy your weekend. Bye everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.